thank you again for the, the invitation to speak. It's been a fantastic few days. Uh, I'm going to try and just wrap up uh, some of the themes. Um, you've kind of read, read who I am and what I do. Um, my, my background to a lot of this is I spent most of my life as a pre-hospital uh, general practitioner in, in the military. And I started at a time where we had nothing. Um, and one of my jobs was to look at over-the-horizon technologies that save um, lives on the battlefield and then try and put in place governance and other structures to get those in. Uh, often getting tips from, from people in this room um, about how we can stop clotting, how we can arrest hemorrhage and right the way through to trying to deliver blood products um, forward. So that's one area where I overlap with, with some of my colleagues that have spoken before. Um, I also enjoy climbing. I happen to be a bit of a freak uh, in that I perform extremely well at extreme altitudes without, um, without any training. Um, so uh, the hardest bit for, of medical school for me was trying to climb the seven summits while squeezing in uh, a medical degree. Um, I did manage to become the youngest person in the world to do that. The current record holder was sort of less than half the age I was when I did it. Um, but I found that, uh, that, that, was, that was really interesting, and the physiology that I was learning in medical school didn't work for me. It was all based around 70 kilogram male at altitude, and as, got, as I got further involved in medicine, I started to look for parallels between the perturbances in your physiology that we experience at extreme altitude and any lessons we can take back uh, into people who are critically ill. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, this is the view from the summit of Everest reflected in one of my colleague's glasses. Um, you can very clearly see the watershed. So you've got the high altitude plateau of Tibet um, to the north and you've got Everest to the south. Um, I'm just going to show you the trailer to the, the, um, the IMAX Everest film, which remains their most um, popular and successful IMAX film. There is a place that is above all others, a place where dreams are chased above the clouds, a place where only the strong and lucky survive. The top of the world where the wind is fiercest is a desolate, deathly place where humans cannot live. Every breath burns the lungs like cold fire. Many have died there on the mountain known as Everest. sure what happened with the, uh, the sound there, but ended with a, an avalanche for, for Herman. Um, why, why would anybody want to go and climb Everest? Well, of course, Mallory gave the best answer, and it was actually on this series of an, been repeatedly asked about why would someone would try and do something that was, that was so ridiculously risky. Um, I've got a slightly different attitude to risk. Um, half of us in this room are going to get cancer. Um, probably about one in five of us are going to end up on intensive care. I was quite lucky that as part of my training to be a GP in the military, I managed to wangle some time working uh, in intensive care. Um, and it was fantastic. We were trying to uh, look after people that were very severely sick. Uh, and I happened to be there with colleagues like Mike Grocott and Kevin Fong. And we noticed some similarities. We thought, how can we exploit this? Um, what we wanted to do was to compare this person with, uh, with this person, um, but for reasons you'll understand, trying to do um, trials in intensive care on clones of critically ill patients who are there for different uh, pathophysiological reasons is extremely difficult. Um, what they did have in common, however, that they were all hypoxic. So we wanted to take 200 healthy volunteers, make them hypoxic by taking them up Everest, um, and we struggled a bit with the funding for that until we solved the problem by getting them to pay to be our guinea pigs. Uh, and, and, it, and it actually worked. We needed two million pounds. We got some funding from traditional 
um, medical um, funding bodies, but they weren't going to pay for rope and oxygen and everything. But these guys paid us a lot of money to be, to be tortured, which was, which was brilliant. Um, so that, that's what we did. We took people up there. Most of the work was done by the, the trekkers who arrived at, um, uh, at base camp, but I'm actually going to concentrate on, on some of the studies we did higher up the mountain because that's where you see um, some of the extreme um, results. We did a whole battery of tests. The, um, probably the most reproducible one was doing cardiopulmonary exercise testing. The worst iteration of this, we had a gastric tonometer. We had both radial arteries cannulated. We were doing lithium dilution um, cardiac output. Um, we had bilateral nears. We had muscles um, nears. And effectively, we had to cycle until we sac started sacrificing our, our gut circulation just to make sure that we were properly properly hypoxic. That was probably the most evil thing we did. Um, to cut a long story short, we, we managed to get 25 people to the summit of Everest and back down safely, uh, which I believe is a, a British record. We put up a lab on the south col of Everest, which um, uh, is the highest lab in the world. And on the way down, it was a little bit windy on the summit, we managed to get some arterial blood gas samples um, from the femoral artery of, of four subjects, um, of, which, of which I was one of them. Um, so some of our results um, were fairly predictable. So this is looking at the, uh, the trekkers. So this is people going to base camp, 5,300 meters. And you can see that the changes that you would expect at altitude, so modest change in sort of hemoglobin by just over a point, uh, and the hematocrit sort of going up, uh, going up a little bit as well, but not, not that much. Um, and if you look at uh, the extreme team, so this was the group of climbers that stayed on the mountain for 75 days. You can see that the hemoglobin's gone up to near 19, and some of the summit climbers had hemoglobins of about 20. Um, that's going to cause problems, obviously, with um, uh, thrombophilia at altitude. Um, altitude itself is prothrombotic. We were doing tags on uh, some of these blood samples as well, um, uh, and it was shown there. And again, a hematocrit that's not going to be very conducive um, to good tissue perfusion. This, for me, was probably one of the most interesting results. And I'll, I'll take you through it. You've seen the Fick equation. And that's the bit that everyone ignores, is the dissolved amount. But if you, if you look at London, you got, we had an average oxygen saturation of 19, hemoglobin of 14. That was the oxygen content of the blood. When we arrived in Namchi Bazaar, which is the sort of Sherpa um, base in, in Nepal, um, sats had dropped a little bit. Hemoglobin's got up a small bit. We're only a few days out from London, so that could be dilutional. And the oxygen content has dropped accordingly. What was surprising is that by the time you trek to Everest Base Camp, the oxygen content of your blood is the same as it is at sea level. So your saturation's gone down, your hemoglobin's gone up, which, which is largely responsible for the compensation. Who in this room has had altitude sickness? Okay, so if you think back to it, it's not like being decompressed from an aircraft. Most of the cases of altitude sickness that I've seen happens some hours after you get there. Yet when you look at the, lead, the literature and the teaching on altitude illness, it says it's hypoxia. That's the sole reason for it. I would put it to you that hypoxia is the trigger for a whole bunch of processes that we don't understand that end up in the effects of hypoxia. Um, and you can see that um, by the time we left, um, our oxygen content was actually higher than it would be at sea level. Um, so, so what's going on here? Um, we talked, um, perhaps talking yesterday about oxygen delivery. Other people have sort of mentioned it during the few days. Your performance in the mountains isn't associated with oxygen delivery. Um, so these were the two uh, gentlemen who first climbed Everest without supplemental oxygen. And the assumption at the time was that they were, they were just elite athletes. They were freaks of nature. Uh, and they had a whole battery of tests that were, um, were done on them. Um, and if you look at one in particular, their VO2 max, and you compare it with sort of non-climbers, completely normal. So they didn't have super normal VO2. So they weren't, so Habler and Messner weren't able to climb Everest without supplemental oxygen because they had increased oxygen delivery. 
if you look at what, um, if you follow that Fick equation through to the rest of our results, um, you can see if you just construct the arterial content um, of your blood is pretty much preserved to around 7,000 meters. For most people, that is extreme altitude. Um, most people would not enjoy going to 7,000 meters, yet there's no physiological reason based on oxygen content that they can't do that. So something else is going on. And the interest that we had from that is, if that's happening in the mountains, what's happening in our patients who are on 15 liters of, of supplemental oxygen, who have peripheral oxygen saturations in their 90s, and have fantastic oxygen content, but they're still critically ill, and they're still dying. The caveat for the rest of the talk is it's, it's just my punt at what I think might be going on. Most of this work has been done by um, the Caldwell Extreme Everest team and a huge number of international collaborators. Um, but these, these are just some of my thoughts. If I was to get involved in an avalanche now, why would I die? Why would I die in an avalanche? Why would I die if I got hit by Richard's car? Why would I die if I had a battlefield injury that we heard about yesterday? Why would I die if I had the bloody airway scenario we saw on the first session? What unites all of that? Sorry? So what's hypoxia? At the brain level, anyone else? Which bit of your body uses oxygen? Mitochondria. And we don't have any tools to investigate mitochondria. And everything that we're doing, you know, with, with great intent, is we're measuring things at the macro level and making assumptions about what's happening at the cellular level. So um, this is me sitting, sitting around uh, on Everest. I've got an oxygen saturation of 56. I'm perfectly happy. My heart rate's 108, which is probably what it is right, right now. Um, you're all familiar with this, but the point I'm trying to make is that we stop measuring what's going on here, and this is the business end of the oxygen cascade. And I think we need to know more about this, and I'm just going to take you through some of the things that we found and some potential areas for, for future research. Um, for me, this was a bit of a sort of William Harvey moment of, of my generation. He managed to see blood flowing in vivo. We used side stream dark field microscopy to image um, individual capillaries uh, sublingually. Each of these black dots is an erythrocyte passing through a capillary in the microcirculation. This is the sort of technology that we had available to us in 2007. And at sea level, you'd see quite good flow. Um, at 6,400 meters, you're seeing a combination of stagnant flow and some hyperdynamic flow. So it begins to give you an idea um, that the microcirculation isn't working. Um, this, is, uh, this slide's courtesy of, of Malcolm Russell, who, who many of you will know, medical director of Kent, Surrey and Sussex. Air ambulance. He was using an in-spectra um, tissue oxygen monitor to look at um, whether that might be any use in his helicopter emergency medical system. <laughs> this story is a, uh, I think, a lady in her 50s who tried to kill herself, and this monitor is attached after ROTSC. Um, and what you can see is that it starts dropping, and, and the critical oxygen tissue saturation seems to be about 70%, borne out through a number of studies. This starts dropping, and it prompts a check for causes. Um, you then find out that there's no pulse. Start CPR, and again, round about 50, you get ROSC again. Um, what then happens 
is it returns to normal. Um, it starts dropping. A bit of epinephrine is dribbled in. During this phase, the patient is um, intubated, transferred to the helicopter, put onto positive pressure ventilation, and packaged for flight. They then start dropping again, and the, the thinking process that Malcolm had was a bit more epi, worked last time, it might work again this time. It carries on dropping, which prompts him to check other things. Then see that the airway pressure is coming up a bit, prompts him to do a needle thor thoracic entesis. Assistant I can't do it. Pops back up again during the flight, it drops again, and you're all aware of how difficult getting reliable monitoring of anything is, is in flight. And once you're down in at this area, then the, your um, capillary, your, your peripheral oxygen saturation is not going to work, your blood pressure cuff is going to be cycling, you're not getting information. Um, anyway, down here, he decompressed the chest with, with a good result, came back here. Uh, but when it dropped again, he just checked the chest and put two fingers, two glove fingers into the, uh, the thoracostomy holes. So it was an adjunct. Other, other services have looked at this, um, didn't really find that it helped. Um, and that's not really the point of what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk to you about a particular piece of kit. I'm just trying to talk to you about principles that I think would be useful to consider sort of going forward. Um, this uh, was a study published in 2009, so around about the same time that Malcolm was doing his work. Um, it's actually a study from 2005, the Combat Support Hospital in Tikrit. Um, so they, they put it on, they only got good data on, on about eight patients. Um, and I've picked, I've picked a couple of them. Um, in red, you've got the systolic blood pressure. Um, in green, you've got the heart rate, and in blue, you've got the tissue oxygen saturation. Um, on the bottom, you have time, heart rate here, SBP there. And here are the interventions. So they were using it to, to see if it could triage whether somebody was going to need critical interventions. And as we heard from Phil Spinella's talk yesterday, when you're in a resource poor field hospital, then being able to anticipate what you're likely to be able to deal with might make the decision between Actually, we can't cope with this. We've just had two of those in, overflies to somewhere else, if you have that luxury. Probably not in, in Tikrit. Um, and and what, you can, what you can see is that the, um, the systolic brush, blood pressure does what it does. The interventions are go to the OR, go to ICU, get some uh, fluid resuscitation, including blood products. But to me, the tissue saturation more accurately reflects the changes in heart rate that represent the physiological response to either something getting worse or getting better. Um, I think particularly, particularly if you look up here, um, once they sort of open the abdomen and get control, um, you know, you can see that changing sort of quite significantly. Tissue alteration shoots up, heart rate returns to normal. They've got control. The blood pressure didn't really change that much at that time. It went up, so not really, not really helping you. Uh, as much. Um, this is just um, another case of somebody who again had one, has some packed red cells, goes into ICU, and again it's the reflection, so it mirrors, um, it mirrors blood pressure quite well, but I think more importantly it reflects heart rate. Um, this, was, uh, this was a study in Pittsburgh um, where they were, uh, they did it over nine months looking at about 150 uh, patients I believe. And again, they used it to predict whether someone would go on to need a life-saving intervention. So again, potentially um, a triage tool for, for pre-hospital EMS. Um, with their, this is their sort of rock curve. And as we heard yesterday, we're on the right side of the line. So it's possibly some predictive value from using um, this sort of system. Um, if you look at what their predictors were, they found a number of them. They looked at sort of the lowest systolic. Um, the desaturation of, of O2 and, uh, and GCS, and the p-values the p aren't, aren't, aren't too bad. Um, the newest iteration uh, of, of these sort of technologies is something uh, called the Cytocam. Um, it's been used to uh, look at patients in real time while they're sort of having ECMO to try and predict what's going on. Um, so in this study, you can read it for yourselves, but they looked at 24 people, 15 survived, 9 died. And these are the videos that need to work. This is a survivor. 
Um, I, it's not projecting brilliantly. If anybody wants to see it afterwards, I'm happy to show it to them. But you can see a nice dynamic blood flow. That's someone who didn't make it. And you can hopefully see the sludging here. So the microcirculation's not working. The microcirculation's not working, then all those red blood cells carrying 100% oxygen are just going around in circles. And they're not getting to the mitochondria. Um, there are some trials going on where we're trying to, people are trying to look at, well, actually, what are the parameters that might make any sense here? Com coming back to, um, to our study on Everest, um, you can see uh, this is our VO2 max dropping, and it actually drops fairly proportionally to the inspired partial pressure of oxygen. Um, so in, in simple terms, at Everest Base Camp, your VO2 max is half that at sea level, uh, and on the summit, it's about a third. So it's not, not quite a linear uh, relationship, and that reflects what happens with, with barometric pressure. Um, you've seen this, and I'm just going to talk you through uh, the gases. That's just to remind you that up to 7,000 metres, oxygen content is preserved. Um, this is quite fun. These, these are some gases that we did on each other. Um, you've got PO2 on the bottom and PCO2 here. And you can, I'll just take you through it. This is sea level. Uh, that's assuming a critical uh, PO2 of about 8. Um, this is now um, at Everest Base Camp, 5,300 metres. Um, getting up into advanced base camp in the Western Coombe at 6,400 metres. Um, this is on the low sea face. That was quite an interesting place to, to try and do a blood gas. It's, it's reasonably steep. People fall down it. Um, and these are, the, these are the results that we're really proud of. So these were taken at 8,400 metres. We had PO2s of between 2.2 uh, and sort of 4.4. And as far as we were aware, we were functioning. Um, these gases were taken, uh, taken off oxygen. There's video of us um, uh, doing the intervention, taking a separate anticubital venous sample so that we wouldn't be accused of uh, making a venous stab and relaying the results down to, um, uh, to the lab. Uh, just a quick aside on performance. It took us two days to get down from, from this place. Um, we'd practiced putting these samples in a, in a flask with a nice slurry and we were reasonably happy with the machine that we had, that we had about six hours before this, we lost the validity of the sample. So we gave it to our best Sherpa and said, you need to get this down to Camp 2. He did it in two hours, having stopped for a cup of tea. So if anyone ever tells you they climbed Everest, unless they did it by themselves, they're lying. They, they, the Sherpas did all the work. And they crawled up behind them and took some hero pictures at the top. They are, they are phenomenal and, and uh, absolutely fantastic companions. So this is the next bit of the story. This is the story of our evolution over four and a half billion years. And for most of that, this is the oxygen content. For most of that, we've been completely anoxic. Um, we actually had a massive, um, this thing's called the Great Oxygenation Event. And it was actually one of the mass extinctions that happened. But sort of back in the primordial soup, you had, uh, it was mainly sort of CO2, it was, everything was anaerobic. Until blue, get, root, sorry, blue green algae came along, and the ancestor of mitochondria was probably something akin to a rickettsial spirochete. And this opened the door to multicellular life. Because aerobic glycolysis is 100 times faster, as well as giving you far more ATP. And all the stuff we've been talking about is just a reflection of that. So up to this point, it could all be done by diffusion. But I'd suggest the reason we have an airway and lungs and a circulatory system is simply that as we've got more complicated, we've got to have a more complicated way of delivering this oxygen to the mitochondria, which are now embedded deeper and deeper within our systems. So everything that you do is important, but this is the only place it sort of matters. Um, now, I hated mitochondria at medical school. It was a bit of biochemistry you had to learn. I quite like 
Karen Brohe's phrase that if you have to learn something every night before an exam, it means it's wrong. Uh, and you have, you know, they've, they've simplified it too much, they've got it wrong. And then he puts up something that's too complicated for normal people to remember anyway. Um, so if you're interested in mitochondria, this is quite a good place uh, to start. Um, just talks about the background of it. And, and Nick Lane's a really interesting evolutionary biologist that um, some of his other theories are that uh, life, uh, that cells, for, um, cells evolved in tiny cracks in underwater vents um, that were just the right size to allow a nucleus and other things to accumulate. So he's, he's a fascinating, uh, fascinating guy. So we thought, okay, we better look at mitochondria as well. This is really quite funny. Uh, this is Chris Imre, who's a professor of vascular surgery. And this is Denny Levitt, who's an anaesthetist doing an open muscle biopsy on him at Everest Space Camp. Um, the reason we chose to do that is that previous studies of mitochondrial function at altitude had not shown any effect. But if you think about how mitochondria work, they, they, they would have instantly switched back to being in their normal oxic state. Um, and we found a bunch of changes that I don't have to go into here, but effectively it feeds into all the stuff you're hearing about um, proteomics, about epigenetics, and all the other omics that are there. So there's dynamic regulation of protein expression. So apart from being a channel for oxygen delivery to mitochondria, the only other function you have is to produce proteins. So there's the two things that you do. You've got to get oxygen in and you've got to make protein. And the protein regulation is significantly affected um, by um, exposure to hypoxia. Um, again, it's just looking at the different types. I, I'm not clever enough to understand all of those. Um, but I think looking at this is important. As you, if you start reading about mitochondrial um, biology, you will start to see that over the, ne the next few decades, more and more things will converge onto it. So you will see um, PAPA being mentioned in terms of cancer, in terms of aging. And I think we're going to, probably saying, probably hoping a bit too much. I think people have tried to find unifying common pathways for lots of things. I think the mitochondria have been neglected for a long time. And I think many disease pathways, the mitochondria will play um, a pivotal part. I'll talk about HIF1 alpha in a, in a second. Um, the other thing we did that was quite interesting is we did functional MRI of phosphate turnover in our hearts, um, which decreased. So my cardiac mass decreased by 11% during my trip to Everest. Um, thankfully, it came back within six months. And we started thinking, why would you want to do that when you're trying to increase your cardiac, you're trying to increase your oxygen delivery? And our theory on that is it goes back to the mitochondria again, that you're trying to get in, and at altitude, you lose muscle um, in preference to fat. So our theory on that is that actually all you're trying to do is to sort of shorten the distances between your poorly perfused capillaries and your mitochondria by getting rid of anything excess in between. So your mitochondrial density actually goes up. You've got fewer of them, but the density goes up. Um, I'll, move, uh, I'll move on. Let's just move about that. Um, so I'm, I'm a GP, and things have to be really simple to make sense for me. I also had to teach Pat Thompson. So I had to make things really, really simple for Pat to understand it. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is that um, I, I'm, a, I'm a reductionist. Uh, and a, and a, a view I take is that biology is not wasteful. Everything happens for a reason. The reason why a juvenile snake is more dangerous than an adult snake is because it's, it's like any juvenile anywhere in the world. Um, if it feels threatened, it'll get aggressive. In the case of a snake, it'll deliver its entire venom sack in a bite. An adult snake is more likely to give you a dry bite because it takes weeks to make it. Um, snake venom is one of the most interesting concoctions of proteins, which is your secondary function. And it takes weeks for this snake to make that. So it's not going to waste it unless it has to. There's a quote that says that half the people that have ever lived have been killed by an insect. Which means that Throughout most of our history, the biggest threat to our existence has been infection. 
But we all know, because we see it in our patients, that our response to fighting infection is quite slow. And often the body's the reason why, you know, one of the reasons we have people in intensive care is the body's um, immune response can't mount in time to fight off the infection. So if you agree that biology is not wasteful, then come across this thing called hypoxia-inducible factor. And every time I look at it, it's responsible for a thousand more pathways that I didn't know existed. And when we first started playing in the mountains, no one knew what this was. We, we had, um, there were certain factors and things out there. But what, what happens with HIF-1-alpha is your body makes this every second. Senses to see if you're hypoxic, and if you're not, it's cleaved. Now, I don't know of any other process in the body where we make something constantly, just in case. And I don't know everything that HIF does, but I think, again, it's going to become more important, probably in a multitude of disease states. If we try and bring that back to hypo hypoxia, um, tons of effects, um, many of which you'll, you'll know. But again, the point here is simply we don't understand this. And we all, we all do what we, we all pick things that we're interested in or that affect our daily management of patients, quite rightly. Um, but I think we need to put some, in, some attention into what is the effect on the microcirculation of crystalloid versus whole blood. So all of the interventions and all the debates we've had today, I'd love to see sort of a big SIT conference in the future where people have sort of said, and the effect on the microcirculation of this intervention is X. Or using this, we have shown that the mitochondria are now working much better. We, we, we're getting there. Sorry, that's just, um, that's the bit where oxygen's used. And what happens is NADH is, is, is um, uh, produced when it's not working. So we're now, we're now getting there um, in terms of having the tools to measure mitochondrial function in real time in vivo. When we did it, we had to take mitochondria, freeze them in liquid nitrogen, ship them back, and, uh, and have a look. In 2012, we managed to do some studies by taking samples and testing them at Everest Base Camp directly. But you can now, there are tools emerging that allow you to look at mitochondrial function in real time. Um, and uh, here they were doing it on, on pigs, and they were basically saying, um, that it was more effective than tissue oxygen saturation. So tissue, if I'd been speaking to you five years ago, I'd have been saying, we should really have a look at tissue oxygen saturation. Now I'm saying, we can really have a look at this. And in five years' time, someone will be saying, yeah, that was all old hat, we should be looking at something else. So I reiterate, I don't have the answers, I just want to challenge you. Um, this is one of the devices that's uh, out there. It's an Israeli um, device. It's looking at, at sort of NADH as the marker that people have generally agreed on is a reflection of whether your mitochondria are working, working properly. Um, and, and what you've got here is you've got someone who's, who's normoxic. They then put them onto 6% oxygen, and you see this rise in NADH. Um, and again, then they switch them back. A simpler way of trying to look at that is trying to work out, and, I, and I'm not going to go into redox states, there are, there are very clever people who can tell you about that, but it's not me. Um, but essentially, if your NADH is very high, that's not good. If it's low, it's better. Um, there's been some work, this was published, I think, last year, um, doing this in sort of uh, real time, trying to predict whether someone's going to have a cardiac arrest. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, again, this was done on a pig, and they were trying to work out what's happening. They were applying for FDA approval to see if it'll get through. I think human studies um, for this technique are still some time away. Um, sorry, I'm flipping around a bit. Um, but this goes back to so another thing. So I lost 22 kilos on Everest, which was great. Uh, and I probably need to go back. Um, Dan also summited Everest. I, I go to Everest by not training, getting drunk every night on the way there, complaining about the increase of beer prices with altitude, which is linear. Um, Dan arrives, puts his head in his sleeping bag, and you can't see him for three days, and you think he's not going to make it. Six weeks later, we're both comfortably 
working on the summit of Everest. So the other big message here is that when we look at our patients, and Richard touched on this earlier, this phenotype doesn't equal genotype. So you can't make assumptions about what's happening inside someone's body or what's happening at their cellular level. A, by looking at them, but I'd also put it to you using some of the macro level tools that we've been accustomed to. And we've had the debate about the systolic blood pressure at 90 for, for, for ages, but you know, so what? Um, and, and the weight loss, um, <coughs> the weight loss here again, I think is the same thing that I was saying with the, the heart, that it's about trying to get the mitochondria closer together. There was a point that was made, I think it was yesterday by the Thor group, that one of the drivers for what we do is somebody's sick, you have to do something. This is a study of, uh, so it's a survival curve in ITU. These are the people we do something to, and these are the people we leave alone and let their bodies sort it out. So you support them rather than intervene. I'm, I'm going to finish now. So I don't know the answers to any of this. I'm just, I'm just teasing you a little bit. Um, but I'm going to give you my own reflection on why, why we climb mountains that I do have an idea of. This is the summit shadow of uh, the peak of Everest being cast out hundreds of miles onto the horizon. You've been climbing for hours at night. You don't know if you're really going to make it. Suddenly you see this. You believe the Earth's going to curve, that the Earth does curve, and you might just get up and down safely. The other quote that Mallory had was far less well known, but I think far more poignant. I'm going to end by letting you read that. I have to thank the organisers. I think they've absolutely nailed that spirit in this conference. So thank you very much.